Ford decided to stop making cars in India in 2021 and mostly retreated from the country after years of trying to make it work. Ford has been in a position where they've been steadily losing market share in India. If you look back about a decade ago, they had about 3% market share uh, of, of all new auto sales in India. Uh, as of last year, they were down to 1.7%. In a statement sent to CNBC, Ford said that it is not leaving India. It will expand its Ford Business Solutions team, which manages sales to commercial customers and employs about 11,000 people in the country. Nevertheless, as part of its restructuring efforts, Ford will stop assembling vehicles in Sanan, India by the fourth quarter of 2021. It will also stop making cars and engines in Chennai by the second quarter of 2022. Over the last 20 years, Ford has lost more than $2 billion in its India business. That is in addition to the $0.8 billion asset write-down it did in India in 2019. After investing significantly in India for many years with unacceptable returns, we have taken difficult but necessary actions, the company told CNBC. The Blue Oval is not the only automaker to pull out of India, and India is not the only country Ford and its Detroit-based American rival General Motors have retreated from. Both Ford and GM have pulled back on international operations in recent years. GM sold its European business, pulled out of India, and several other countries around the world. These moves signify a shift in strategy for Ford and GM, the two largest American automakers in terms of sales. They used to focus on increasing vehicle volumes and on growing their presence around the world. Now they want to focus more on being profitable, even if it means being smaller. And the place where they are most likely to achieve that is right at home, in North America. When India began opening its economy in the early 1990s, it seemed to promise a lot of opportunity. India is the world's second most populous country, with about 1.4 billion people. It had an economic growth rate of about 4.4% in the 1970s and 1980s, but that jumped to 5.5% in the 1990s, and then over 7% in the 2010s. Auto industry forecasters for years predicted that India would become the world's third largest automotive market by 2020. In 2011, JD Power predicted 11 million light vehicles would be sold in India per year within the decade. That hasn't happened. Passenger vehicle sales totaled 2.7 million in 2020, far below the bullish predictions from a decade ago. Only about 42% of India's automotive manufacturing capacity was being used as of 2021, Ford said to CNBC in an email. This, the automaker said, combined with ongoing uncertainty in the long-term growth prospects of the auto industry and economy have resulted in serious challenges. It's proven to be a, a high cost, um, a low margin country. There are a number of problems. India's customers are often price sensitive. 95% of the cars sold in India cost less than $20,000. That is likely a big part of why India's auto market is dominated by two wheelers, motorcycles, mopeds, scooters, and others. More than 80% of vehicle sales in India are two wheelers. Cars are only about 15%. It is not even great for some companies that sell two wheelers. Harley Davidson has struggled there. The company shut down its factory in Bawal and downsized its offices in Gurgaon in September 2020. About a month later, it announced a partnership whereby Indian motorcycle maker Hero would continue to sell and service Harley-Davidson bikes in the country. In the years leading up to the deal, Harley-Davidson had seen its sales consistently fall from 4,641 units in fiscal year 2015 to 2,676 units in 2019. Some automakers have done well in the country, especially some from Japan and Korea. Suzuki was one of the first automakers to enter the country, and as of September 21, had a 47.72% share of the Indian passenger car market. That is through its partnership with domestic manufacturer Maruti. That is by far the largest share of any maker in the country. Korean maker Hyundai has also succeeded with a portfolio of small, inexpensive cars. It had the second largest market share with 17.39%. Indian makers Tata Motors and Mahindra and Mahindra came in third and fourth with 8.27% and 5.8% share, respectively. 
For a while, Ford looked as though it was finding a path towards success in India. It released the EcoSport, a compact sport utility vehicle made specifically for the India market. It was something of a hit and was later exported to other countries. After launch, launching EcoSport, somewhere they lost the game and they didn't upgrade the EcoSport as the competition launched new product with new features and, and a very good looking, uh, sexy looking vehicles because looks also matter a lot in India. So somewhere they lost, I don't know, uh, they became more export oriented or they, uh, I don't know what, what went into the management uh, board about India. Ford was a very, very promising manufacturer for India. In 2019, Ford and Mahindra had announced plans for a joint venture. It was to make and sell Ford vehicles in India and Ford and Mahindra brand vehicles in other emerging markets. That partnership was scuppered in December 2020. Despite the fact that it is shuttering all of its factories, Ford says India will still have the company's second largest salaried workforce globally. Besides Ford Business Solutions, Ford India will continue engine manufacturing for export, as well as full customer support operations with service, aftermarket parts, and warranty support. Still, by leaving the country, Ford is, some say, leaving its customers stranded, just as other automakers have done. For example, in India, drivers pay vehicle registration fees for 15 years. And if a person who has bought a vehicle in maybe 2016 by GM, and only one year he got service, and now for the rest of the 14 years is on his own. The biggest loss is first is resale goes for a toss because there is no uh, product coming in by GM. GM is not more. Second, the service support is not there. And with the kind of latest technology the major cars have, the roadside garages cannot help you. You still need a company backup to be there. So Ford is still talking with dealers to support for five years service, but I have my doubts because it's very difficult for a customer to go back to the same dealer. And if the dealer is, has uh, or dealer or the company doesn't have an interest to be in the country to give the same kind of service what they were giving before. Indian Ford dealers, many of whom invested large sums to build their businesses, are also being left behind. So for Ford, there were around 170 dealers and around 391 outlets. Around 10 or 12 new outlets had come just four months back of the announcement of exit. Think of the dealer. We had invested three crores, five crores on that investment, thinking that he'll be earning uh, by the Ford product coming in. GM pulled out of Russia in 2015 and sold its European Opel and Vauxhall brands in 2017 to what was then PSA Group and is now Stellantis. 2017 was also the year GM stopped selling cars in India through its local subsidiary, though it continued to make vehicles for export to other countries. GM said in 2020 it was leaving Australia, New Zealand, and Thailand. The Australia exit had been in process over a few years. The 2020 announcement came after GM's 2017 shutdown of the Holden brand, which had been producing cars in Australia for about 70 years. Ford said it would stop making cars in Brazil in early 2021. Some in the auto industry have expected Ford to retreat from other regions as well. After GM pulled most of its operations out of Europe, Ford was anticipated to do the same. In 2019, Ford did slash thousands of jobs for its turnaround plan on the continent. Ford has also struggled in China, the largest market in the world, though that region is the only place where the automaker grew share in 2020. It lost share in every other international market where it operates, in large part because it has been pulling back its presence in these regions. Ford lost money in each of its geographic business regions outside of North America in 2020 on an EBIT basis, which stands for Earnings Before Interest and Taxes. Automakers such as Ford and GM typically use EBIT to report international earnings or losses. Its exclusion of interest expenses and local tax impacts can give a clearer picture of a region's profitability. Ford lost nearly $500 million in South America in 2020, more than $800 million in Europe, about $500 million in China, and more than $100 million in all other international markets combined. Then there are markets where American makers barely compete, such as Japan, which is one of the world's five largest auto markets. The, the withdrawing from these markets is the consequence of big 
decades of bureaucracy. I mean, General Motors uh, was the biggest car maker in the world uh, for 70 years until the, the, the financial crisis hit America around 12 years ago. But before that, it was the biggest in the world. And that means that you are strong, you're big, but you, it also means that in most of the cases, it means that you have a lot of bureaucracy, processes are slow, and the decision-making is very inefficient in many cases. In the case of Europe, GM and Ford were never really able to capture a share of the higher end of the market either. Now, the biggest problem they had, for example, with respect to Opel, is they were always the second cousin to uh, Mercedes, Audi, and BMW. You know, they were they, they never made that, that jump to that premium category. GM and Ford are not the only ones facing difficulties in some of the world's emerging markets in Asia or elsewhere. Asian brands, or even European ones, are also at least reducing their presence. The French manufacturers in Southeast Asia, or in, even in China, they are struggling there to, to keep running their business. I mean, their market share has dropped in a big way. All of these different markets have very different needs in terms of product and price. They have different regulations car makers need to conform to, such as with respect to safety or emissions standards. The consumers in these different markets like different styles and designs of vehicle. Americans, for example, buy a lot of vehicles that are far larger than what could be effectively marketed in other countries. So American companies are pulling back, becoming leaner, and more focused on profitability. Investors are really demanding it because all they've seen for years are disappointing results coming out of India, uh, China, and, and elsewhere. So investors are, are, are really kind of fed up with the strategy. I'd, I'd say more broadly, there's been a shift in strategy for the auto industry. They've, they've gone from being very market share and volume growth focused to more focused on bottom line profitability. Of course, that is a gamble as well if the country a company is leaving ends up becoming a key market in the future. For some makers, uh, some markets are not relevant or they are more a headache than a, a source of profits. So in those cases, they just leave, which in, in my opinion, it makes sense if you don't have any potential. I don't, I don't see why you have to be everywhere, even if you're a global company. but. You must consider that leaving a market uh, means that, I mean, your image is, is totally ruined. And if this market becomes a key one in the future, then you could regret the, your decision, no? The Indian auto market is still expected to continue growing. American companies that leave countries such as India also risk creating the impression among consumers that their presence in the country is unreliable that it may not be worth it to invest in a car from a manufacturer that is liable to pull up stakes and leave the country in five years. This large global pullback by Detroit automakers reverses decades of attempts by both to be truly global automakers. Ford has been the most global in terms of taking the Ford brand around the world all the way back to the, you know, the Henry Ford days. They were you know, they were ex exporting kit cars to even places like Japan way, way back. GM took its brands to other countries in some cases, such as Chevrolet in Latin America and Asia and Buick in countries like China, where it has been remarkably successful. GM also bought brands in other countries, such as the Opel and Vauxhall brands in Europe and the Holden brand in Australia. Ford also tried to capture a larger share of the high end of the market in both the United States and elsewhere. At one point, it owned the British Jaguar, Land Rover, and Aston Martin brands. But now it seems Ford's best market is North America, and the biggest and perhaps best of that is the United States. The company sold 4.5 million vehicles at retail around the world in 2020. 2.3 million of those vehicles were sold in North America, and 2 million just in the United States. The next largest single market was Europe with 1.1 million vehicles, and then China with 0.6 million. 
Furthermore, what sells in the United States tend to be pickup trucks and SUVs, especially larger ones which carry higher price tags. Like General Motors, Ford has almost entirely stopped selling traditional passenger cars. It sold just 55,906 passenger cars through September of 2021, compared with 598,779 SUVs and 742,819 trucks. Its best-selling vehicle is also the best-selling vehicle in the U.S., the Ford F-Series, better known for its half-ton F-150 full-size pickup. Ford sold 534,831 of them up through September of 2021. Its best-selling SUV is the three-row midsize Explorer. Ford doesn't disclose how much money it makes off individual models, but it did say average transaction prices across its range hit record levels in 2021. As consumers increasingly opt for trucks, crossovers, and SUVs, Ford seems to be trying to lean into its strengths. It released the Maverick in 2021, a small front-wheel drive mini pickup with a price tag starting around $20,000. It also revived the Bronco brand name for both a new Bronco model and a Bronco Sport, which is smaller and based in the Ford Escape platform. The Mustang brand name has been broadened to include an electric crossover with a starting price of nearly $43,000. The automaker is also trying to leverage the power of the Raptor brand name, which graces a high-performance version of the F-150. Both Ford and General Motors have profits top of mind at a time when they are having to sink billions of dollars into developing electric and autonomous vehicle technology and root out something else that might help them keep the competitive edges in the markets they still have. The sheer cost of electrification alone is enough to force any automaker to trim any business or product line that is not delivering badly needed profits. The amount of R&D &E investment and then the tooling investment is, is going to be in the multiple billions for each one of these companies. So you, you can't afford to continue to subsidize, you know, money losing operations. You know, you've, and you've got to skinny down your product line. Of course, both of these companies still do have a presence in many countries around the world. In some cases, a sizable one. China remains an important market, especially for GM. Vehicles such as Corvettes and Ford Mustangs sell around the world. In fact, the Mustang sells remarkably well among sports cars even in places such as Europe, where there is plenty of competition.